Hi everyone, Curtis is here from Goth Rider Creations and today should be episode one of how to make your own resin fretboard. Stay tuned. So, today should hopefully be my first proper tutorial video. Now, I've not wanted to do any up until now because it's mostly been stuff that I've never done before or generally do semi-competently. So uh, yeah, but this I have actually done. Um, I've done quite a bit of resin lamination back in the day. Um, I've done some resin pouring in the last few years. So I like to think I'm pretty clued up. Now, I've had a look online and there's hardly anyone making resin fretboards. Um, the only person I've seen really on the YouTube sphere is um, Bell's Art. And uh, if you haven't seen him, please go and have a look. The guy's amazing. He makes guitars out of pencils and newspaper. And God, I think he even made one out of concrete. The guy's a legend. Love your work, man. Um, but yeah, not many people are doing it. Now, in his recent guitar, he just got a guitar neck and he just poured resin on top of it and made the fretboard, which is a very cool way of doing things and is something that we will cover in one of these options. Um, but I want to do fabric resin fretboards. Um, I've not seen anybody doing it really. I'm sure some people have, but it's not very well known. So I wanted to see if I could, you know, work through it. And I'm actually going to go step by step with everything. I'm going to show you guys the moulds, uh, mould releases, construction, the resin itself. We're going to go through everything. And... It's back to my old ethos of you don't need to spend a fortune. I'm going to show you some really simple, really cheap ways of starting out and seeing how it goes. And if you enjoy it, then go and buy custom made, you know, forms and go and buy, you know, tons of resin and experiment and whatever else. But initially, give it a go. So it's not that uncommon. Um, I believe the first ever plastics that we know of is actually Bakelite and that was created the beginning of the 20th century. It was used for everything from toilet seats to radios to everything um, and what most people don't know is Bakelite in its general form is pretty much fabric and phenolic resin um, which funnily enough is currently used by Ridgelight, um, the amazing synthetic um, ebony effect um, fretboards uh, is basically just paper and phenolic resin so it goes way back to over a hundred years ago for the original stuff obviously updated for modern materials so you know if Ritualite can do it why can't we um, we might not have a manufacturing plant and we might not be able to get the you know ebony effect but we'd get pretty close if we want to now what we want to start with is the molds now, what we generally see, um, the few examples that I have found online of resin work is what's known as micarta. Um, I know Tim Sway for his GGBO last year, he made this gorgeous um, sort of waved fabric um, fretboard um, for his little mandolin thing that he made. And I absolutely love that thing. Um, and that is essentially what we're doing. But my carter, more often than not, relates to knife making, um, for making the handles or scales, I believe they're called. And uh, I don't know if anyone's looked online. I know I have. This is basically the mould that you always see. Let's uh, assemble this now so you can see what I'm talking about. That is pretty much the mold that they will make obviously another piece of wood on that side let's there we go let's make it complete this is pretty much the mold that i've seen almost everyone online making their micarta with and if we use side cam hey everyone we can see what we're talking about so they just get ginormous lumps of wood lock it together get way too much resin and fabric and they kind of squash it all in and then they get another block of wood and then they put it on top 
and then they get their trusty clamps out, and then they clamp it to death like it owes them money. And then three days later, because they use way too much resin, um, they try and get the mould apart, but they can't because they haven't done a proper mould release. Um, one person I saw did use uh, greaseproof paper, which is something we will come to. Um, but they clamped it so hard, all the resin just forced its way out of the paper into the wood anyway. And then more often than not, they have to go to the bandsaw, cut this entire mould off and throw it away to get to the thin little sliver of micarta in the middle. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of waste. And it's, yeah, this is absolutely overkill. Um, if you're doing some kind of crazy deep pour with very unsound materials, then maybe, but... You know, I mean, even the knife scales they're making them from, they're 10 mil, 12 mil thick at the absolute most. So all they're really doing is making an inch chunk and they're using enough wood to brace a car with. It just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So we are going to look at some much better options for what we're doing. I'm not saying that this is, you know, you can't do it like that. You can, but it's a hell of a waste. So, first thing we're going to do is look at laminations. Now, I'm going to be making three different fretboards for this tutorial. Um, and I'm going to show you three different moulds, three different types of materials. It's all going to be the same fabric, but it's going to be different ways of doing it. Um, I'm going to show you all the different mould releases I can and everything. So, we'll go through it bit by bit. Now, the mould is literally just something that it sits in. To allow the resin to cure. Now with the fretboards it's really up to personal taste. I mean some people like them as thin as 5mm, some people like them as chunky as 10mm, varying degrees in between. The, the norm is between sort of 7 and 8 to start with. Now you do need to take into consideration the radius that you're going to be putting on there um, depending on whether you're going for the 9.5 Gibson or a shallow is no you know radius at all. Um, you're looking at taking between you know zero and two mil at the edges So you do need to factor that in as you would with any other fretboard um, but with the resin it is It's harder to sand than wood unless you've got really you know heavy duty, you know ebony or iron wood or whatever um, So it is something to consider uh, resin will gum up your uh, sandpaper a lot quicker than most timbers um, so, yeah, it's something to consider. If you want to get it thinner, less work later, it can be the way forward. Now, what your first option is, isn't really a mould as such, but a flat mould. Now, you will see this more often than not with um, carbon fibre work. Um, anytime you see any of the manufacturers making carbon fibre plates, this is basically what it is. You're going to make a sheet of resin and fabric. So all we've done, and here we go, you can see, we're going to use denim for this one. So you take your sheets of denim, you impregnate them with resin, and you stack them up, and you stack them up, and you keep stacking, adding resin, and there you go. You don't need moulds on the sides, you don't need any of that. Um, as long as you've got a large enough surface, which obviously this isn't, um, it will work. Okay. The options for the materials are melamine board, standard IKEA melamine covered chipboard. This stuff works amazingly. Resin will not stick to it. As far as I can tell from what I've done over the years, the only thing that sticks to it is super glue. So you can go to town on it, you can go crazy. The only thing you need to be careful of is if you are putting the sides on, obviously not to scale, um, you're going to be cutting through the melamine onto the chipboard. Now that chipboard will stick to everything. So be very careful when you've got any joins, you're going to need to seal those, but we'll get to that in a bit. Now this is a very cheap, very easy option. Um, you can get it pretty much anywhere. You can buy sheets of it in the big box stores or the DIY stores. Um, you can break off a piece of furniture. Um, 
they've got marketplace. Usually people are giving away IKEA shelving units and just one shelf would be absolutely perfect. So for this, we're gonna be working with between seven and eight centimeter widths. And we're doing roughly 50 centimeter lengths. So this is the most common option. But we have one better. And that is glass. This is perfect for this kind of application because nothing's gonna to stick to it. Um, it will take a lot of heat from the resin and it does not leave any texture, it doesn't leave anything behind. If you want a real glass smooth finish, a lot of people think you have to put extra resin on the top and then sand it back and polish it. Now you can do that, but it is a hell of a lot of work. It is insane the amount of effort you'll need to go to to get it immaculate because resin will scratch a lot easier than the woods you'd normally be using for the fretboards. So, well, unless you're using really soft woods like I tend to. But anyway. um, so yeah, if you want a really glass smooth finish, use glass. Um, it's really simple. You just make sure you get enough resin on there first and you just make sure you put your fabric on upside down and then layer it up as we'll do in a bit and there you go. And once it's dry, you will literally just crack it off the glass and you will get a perfectly mirror smooth top. So that's what we want to go through here. Now, most people do not have large chunks of glass floating around in their house. Um, and try not to do it on the windows, people. The resin runs down, it, it doesn't look right. But what most people forget is another form of glass that they've got in their houses is a mirror. I'm not going to show you the other side of the room, but that is a perfectly valid option. It's glass. It's just got silver on the back to make it reflective. So this is absolutely perfect. It is large, flat, smooth, and will do the trick. So this is exactly what we need. Um, you know, You've probably got a couple of old mirrors floating around in the house that you don't use anymore that sat in a cupboard. Um, also, old glass picture frames. They're perfect for that. You've got a big sheet of glass. People don't, excuse me, people don't think of it. So this is a brilliant option. Now, the only thing you need to be careful of is one, it needs to be immaculately clean. Um, get a scraper, get rid of any old bits of whatever, um, fingerprints, anything like that. Give it a good scrub before you start because if there's anything left behind it will show through or if you're really unlucky it will actually embed into the resin and then stick on the surface so then you'll be stuck with whatever bits of whatever is on there so give me two seconds i'm going to quickly clean this now so get that nice and clean and what we're going to do with this one is one of the options for the mold release and that is wax now, a lot of the professionals will tell the, you that you need partial paste and you need hard mold wax and this, that, that and the other. Um, harder waxes do help because I believe they have a higher melting point and resin can get quite hot. Um, and especially if you're doing um, pre-preg carbon fiber or uh, autoclave work or things like that, you need to worry about heat. So a lot of people prefer using specialist waxes but for this application wax is wax and we are going cheap and cheerful turtle wax old school car polish i believe it's silly something like four pounds a tub depending on where you get it from so it is literally just a small amount of that get it on there everyone has their own way and this is one thing you will learn if you start getting into this is that it's almost like superstition. Everyone has their particular way of doing things. Some people will say that you've got to put it on thick enough that it looks like an air, host, uh, air hostess's makeup. Um, some people say it's got to go on so thin that you need you know, an electron microscope to, electron microscope to know that you've done it. Um, some people say you don't buff it off, buff it off. Some people say you do. It's just, 
everyone has their own way and it's always good to find your way um, so don't take everything I say as gospel um, God, I hope no one takes anything I say as gospel but um, yeah um, a little bit of wax I find will help so you don't need a lot just a few dabs on there and then do a light buff off don't go to town don't try and you know scratch your elbow on the thing just give it a buff over and that will help I mean it is glass so nothing should stick to it but in case there are some light surface scratches or something on there this will just help make sure that nothing drastic sticks to it so that will do and all we're going to do with this one and I see this getting wrong all the time and it's one of my buttons is if we go back to the awful box of doom nearly, um, you've got the awful box of doom there what a lot of people do is they just wedge everything in there then use the clamp and just randomly put in five clamps and crank each one to death and then let it dry now the problem is you've got no equal pressure you've got no idea what's going on there um, theoretically one half could be five mil thick the other half could be an inch thick it's just it doesn't work so this is my personal top tip for this one and that is oh, right. plastic packers door shims window shims these are plastic shims of exact thickness that you use to make sure that you've got the window or the door level inside the door frame because you don't want it too tight. Um, you can pick these up for a couple of quid in any hardware store, I'm hoping anywhere around the world. Um, and these are absolutely ideal because with the fretboards, if you're going to go with the um, fabric side of things, if you've got a load of fabric on there, it is going to hold a lot of air and it is quite flexible. So you can really push down and squeeze a lot of the thickness out of it. So at the moment, it's probably five mil high. You put some pressure on there or once you've got it with resin, it will weight it down you've probably got more like three mil. So what you want to do is get these shims and with a good pair of scissors, you can cut them up into single strips. So you get a five mil and a three mil. You put those together. What I like to do is hot glue gun these together, try not to use too much so it doesn't add, add extra thickness. And then you've got an eight mil spacer. So all you do is you just layer up your fabric and layer up your fabric and keep putting all the layers you want. Don't worry, this isn't how we're doing it. I'm just giving you an example. So we get all of these layers in there. You get your eight mil spacers. And then you get your board and you stick it on there. And then you weight it down and you get enough pressure on there that it does the trick. Now, what I've worked out is I want to make eight mil thick fretboards. Um, so once you squash it down, it's more likely going to be more like 10, 11 mil before you put pressure on there. So you put 10 layers of fabric, 11 layers of fabric, whatever it is. Then you put that on top and then with the pressure, you make sure that you're sitting on those packers and then it is exactly eight mil everywhere. Um, obviously, if you can, put a few in each corner and then you've got that there. Um, that is the most accurate way I've found of making sure you get an absolute dead uh, spot on thickness for your boards. So, little top tip for you. So, that is as basic as you get for that mold. So now we will move on to the next option.
which is the melamine edged. Um, if you're going to want to do any kind of more extreme compression, um, what I'm going to be doing is taking loads of the edge scraps from the bits that I cut there and I'm going to make it kind of an edge board that will then lay flat. So rather than having the flat layers here, it's actually going to be more like if it's on its edge. Now, I've never seen anyone do that, and that's because actually creating that kind of an effect is not easy. Um, the amount of work involved in actually saturating each individual strip of um, denim is a nightmare, um, and you can't do it quick enough to compress it down the same way as we're doing with this one. So I'm going to be making a custom mold for that. And we have the timber pre-cut, because I'm working off the Blue Peter example. So it's going to be a board like this, and then some end pieces, and that will do it. And then all we're going to do is we're going to take individual strips of denim, and we're just going to lay them one on top of the other and make an edge profile. Let's get that on the side so we can see what we're doing. And then I'm just going to glue up loads and loads and loads of these strips until we get an edge profile that we like. So, as you can see, <laughs> it's going to take a lot of strips of fabric. Now, Ideally, you would use melamine for this, um, but I don't have a lot because pretty much everything I have is in the furniture in the house, um, and I didn't want to go out and buy any. Uh, just, I don't see the point. So um, my recent new friends, uh, manufacturers locally, gave me an absolute ton of pine, so I decided to make it out of pine. Um, one, because I actually want to try a different mould release for this. Now, this is what we're going to do. This is what we have for our mould. Now, you can use wax, but wax will not work nearly as well on timber. It's just, it doesn't cohese. Um, if it's treated timber, if it's varnished or something like that, wax will probably wouldn't be so bad. But for this, it's not going to be any kind of an option. So what I'm going to do is screw this together, get it to the right dimensions, and then we will start assembling and then I can show you what you need to do to make this resin pipe. simple as that. Um, make sure you countersink all of your screw holes because you want this to be absolutely flat and flush. Um, you don't want it wobbling around on your table. Um, and the other thing to mention as well, make sure your desk, your table, your workbench, whatever, is level. Um, with this kind of laminations, it's not as important because you are setting the pressure with weighting it for the glass and with this through just the natural weight of the fabric and the resin. Um, if you're going to start doing pours, you want to make sure everything's level because obviously if it's like that, then it's all going to pull at one end. So that's always important. Now, this is raw timber, so this is probably the worst thing to use to make a mould. But I have been doing some research and I think we can actually get this to work.
this is an experiment even for me, so we shall see. Um, if you want to make sure it's going to work, use Melamine and do what I've done here. Just make the base, make the back, make the sides. Um, if you're going to do a pour, all you've got to do is literally turn it on its side, add another piece of timber there, and you're done. But, and this is a big but, with the micarta blocks of death, generally people do it that way round. Now the problem is gravity will force things down the sides here. So you don't want that. What you want to do is, as we've done here, have everything on top of the base. And then that way the resin has got to physically go past the wood. It can't just drop down any cracks. Um, if you get it really wrong, then nothing's going to stop the resin. If it's a really deep pour or it's heavy weight, it will find a way through pretty much anything. It can even find its way through the pores of the wood sometimes if it's thin enough glass effect resin. Um, but we can limit the inclusions. Um, so what we're going to do, and what I should have done initially really, is we're going to use silicon. Now, some people say that you can't use silicon because it inhibits the... Um, The drying of the resin. Um, if you used enough of it or if it was again a massive deep pour or something where you've got to worry about every little issue then silicon could be a problem. Um, I know that there are people that actually make silicon free mold sealants and stuff like that but that's very specialist. In this situation it's absolutely fine um, and you don't need to go anything too fancy I got that for the pound shop, literally one pound for bargain basement, silicon, bathroom sealant. Um, I wouldn't use it for a bathroom personally because it's probably got no mould resistance and it probably is going to be bloody awful. But for a mould that you're basically going to throw away afterwards, who cares? So all we're going to do is literally, I'm going to put a couple of screws in these side sections to the back, which I should have done earlier, and then blow it all apart, silicon it together, put it back together. And there we have it so all sealed uh, as you saw you don't need to put death loads of silicon like most people do they use like two tubes per seam it just if you're going to be doing something where you need tapered edges and you don't want dead straight lines then yeah you're going to need a bit of silicon and you're probably going to need a forming tool to get those perfect sort of curved transitions we don't need to worry about that because we're making a fretboard and we're going to be radiusing and cutting this thing down anyway. We're just making a blank, so it really doesn't matter. Um, mold releasing, if you're taking things out of the mold, having those kind of curves does help a bit. Um, dead straight 90 degrees is not so easy because it can actually lock itself in there with the resin once it's cured. So it swings and roundabouts. We don't want a death load of silicon in here because we're going to do a mold release anyway. So we're going to keep it nice and simple. You only need enough silicon just to bridge that gap. It's almost like making a gasket for an engine. Um, so you don't need a lot of it. And as you saw there, as soon as I screwed it all together, even that thin bead of uh, silicon, most of it squeezed out anyway. So yeah, save yourself some money. It's a lot less aggro. So that's the basis for the mold. All we've got to do is do a release. Now there are many cost-effective options for releases. Everyone seems to think that you either need to use PVA mold release, the sort of greeny blue stuff they use for uh, car bodies. That stuff's expensive and you need a compressor and you need a gun and you need to be able to thin it down. It's just, we don't have a spray booth, that's a nightmare. Um, the other thing that people use all the time is Tyvek tape. Now that is a specific product, product made for doing this kind of thing. 
and it is very, very good. It does exactly what it's supposed to do. It's also like a tenor a roll or something stupid like that. Now, this mould, if we were keeping this forever, we were going to use this multiple uses, multiple pulls, then, yeah, we might worry about the materials, we might get some Tyvek for the edges, you know, we might get some high-density polyethylene sheets that they use to make, like, the moulds. Um, if you've ever watched um, Nick Zometti, um, when he makes his blanks before he does his turning, those white blocks with all the washers and the bolts, um, that is high-density polyethylene, and it's amazing stuff because nothing will stick to it. It's the same stuff they used to make the old-school thick white chopping boards out of. Um, but it's expensive stuff. You're looking about £40 a foot. It's just, it's not cheap. Um, so that's not an option either. Um, but that whole Tyvek tape thing, instead, old-school brown parcel tape. Nothing sticks to it. It's amazing. Um, I've used it for years for as a basis mould release. And you can't get much better. Um, you can literally just use this and then just put strips down. Try and be careful. Try not to get any wrinkles in it. Try and keep it as flat and as neat as possible. But if you can get it laid down nice and thin and cleanly, it works perfectly. You cannot get any better than this stuff. And you literally just lay it down, smooth it out. And nothing will stick to it. That will do everything you want. So that's that one all done. Nice and simple. Um, yeah, you can't get much easier than that. So that's mould two done. We'll leave that to dry. And then we're going to come to the final mould we're going to make. And this one is Bargain Basement. This is amazing. Um, if you're only making one fretboard or if you're only making one part and you don't need to go to the effort of making a custom mold then you all you really need is just something to hold the resin so what we're going to do is something that I've used successfully in the past takeaway containers old school Chinese takeaway metal containers um, if you can find plastic ones that are the right size for the part you're making, that's great. Um, we're not doing that here because you kind of need to be careful with certain plastics. They don't always react well to resins. Um, polyethylene is fine. I think ABS is okay. Some of them are not too happy. Um, and I looked and looked and looked and I couldn't find a piece of Tupperware that was long enough to actually fit a fretboard so I kind of gave up on that one but I have used this successfully in the past so all we're going to do is take some of these cut them up stick them together and make a mold <laughs> as weird as it sounds so we've got 18 16 centimeters each and we need roughly 50 mil, so it's going to be these three. So all we do, that's three, is we chop the end off of one, we chop both ends off of that one, and then stick all three together. Um, it looks a bit silly, but you'd be surprised, it does actually work. Now, one thing I didn't check was the overall dimensions. Oh, look at that. It comes in at seven centimeters, which is pretty much perfect for the width. So that's that. Um, now, this isn't the ideal way of doing it. Absolutely not. It's corrugated. You've got a pattern on the bottom. This is not the way to go. You can mitigate that somewhat, but you will need to surface this because the base won't be perfect. The sides won't be perfect nothing about it is going to be immaculate so if you do go this route it is the cheapest route but it's going to mean more labor you know if you can get glass and do that that's fine the reason we're doing this one is because i do actually need sides for this because i am going to be using all of the scraps left over from when i cut up this denim i i don't waste anything 
you should see the timber pile outside that Mrs. Gothrider hates. But we are actually using all of the little bits of scrap left over from when I cut it up. So these are tiny little bits. And I don't know, I've never tried it in this setting, but I think that all these little strips all melded together with the resin will actually look very cool. So a bit of an experiment, but I wanted to show all the different options. So I figured we'll give it a go. Um, so what I'm gonna do is start chopping these up and then we can start gluing them together and getting it all sealed up. And there you have it. It's awful, but it will get you done in a pinch. Um, I wouldn't recommend it. This is probably the worst way to do these things. Um, if you can, make the micarta giant monstrosity before you make this. Um, but it is an option if you don't have a lot of materials or whatever else. I mean, the likelihood of being able to pull a really nice fretboard from this is pretty much zero. Um, if you're gonna pull something from it, which I'm gonna do, it's gonna need a lot of work. You know, you're better off spending the time getting the materials, getting something like that. But if you need an amount of resin to make a blank for something, um, you know, if you wanna make a small lump of resin so then you can cut nut blanks or um, something like that, this is absolutely fine. I mean, this size is probably a bit useless, but 
one of the individual pots, flatten that out in there, pour an amount of resin in the bottom, let it cure, pop it out, and then you've got a lump of resin that you can use for something. That, this is absolutely fine, so don't discount the cheap and easy option. Um, <laughs> this is more for entertainment value than anything, um, but this is what I'm going to be using for the scraps, so it really doesn't matter if it works. Um, one caveat I would say, put this inside some kind of a cardboard box or something, because if it does leak, you don't want it pouring out all over your floor. So this is basically what we're doing. Now, one of the reasons that I'm doing this is an old props trick that I learned back in the day. Um, Bill Duran, Punish Props, legend. Uh, him and his Mrs. Brickney, lovely, lovely people. Um, I learned a few things from them once I came out of the props world and I started doing my own thing. Um, and they always say, have a backup mold for somewhere. Have either a silicon mold with some parts or a cup or something. Have a spare mold always available whenever you're doing resin work because invariably you will always mix up too much resin. Um, you do that because you do not want too little resin. The last thing you want is to do some kind of a pour and then find out that you're a smidge too short and then you've got to desperately run around and quickly mix more resin and add exactly the right amount of pigment or whatever else so it all matches. It's an absolute nightmare. It's one of the worst things that can happen. So you always pour 10% or mix 10% more than you need just in case. So almost always you've got a spare lump of resin sat there. Now more often than not, you just leave that in the mixing cup and it goes hard and you throw it away. But for our purposes, nut blanks. You know, you always need that. Now if you're one of these people that only use nut, you know, wooden nuts, because I mean wooden nuts, uh, bone nuts or brass nuts for tone or whatever, then throw it away by all means. The rest of us, we need that sometimes. And especially if you've got really nice coloured resins, really nice pigments or whatever else, something like that's really useful. So you have a cheap, nasty mould somewhere and then you pour whatever it is you're making and then what's left, you just dump into that little thing. And then, you know, if you do wood turning or you know, resin turning, have a pot and then just fill it up with resin. And then when it gets to a size, You've got a chunk that you can do whatever with. You can experiment. So, yeah, definitely not this, but something. It's always useful. So the plan is that I'm going to do the mirror first, do the flat sheet with the denim, and then any leftover resin will get mixed up with the denim scraps, and then we'll go in here. And then I will move on to doing the vertical stacks and then any spare leftover resin from that before it goes off will go into this thing and then it just saves wasting anything. So it's almost like getting a free fretboard because we're using the scraps of the den and we're using the scraps of the resin. No harm, no foul. So I think that'll do it for this one. Um, we've got our three basic moulds. Uh, next episode I'm going to show you how to mix your resins properly. It's one of the major mistakes that a lot of people make. Um, also preparation as well, temperature, humidity, things like that. Uh, the PPE you're gonna need, because it is quite important with this stuff. And I'm also gonna show you some of the products that you can use to tint and color your resins. Um, sometimes just the plain fabric is nice underneath, but sometimes you wanna add a little bit of extra pop. And if it's something like Hessian or an open poured fabric, having some kind of colored resin in there as a contrast can look really awesome. So I'm going to show you all of that and then we are actually going to fill these molds. So as always, thank you very much for joining me. Um, please like and subscribe if you haven't already. Um, please let me know what you think. If there's any questions you have that you want answered about resin, anything you've thought of, any misconceptions that you think are out there. Um, yeah, Drop us a comment, let us know, and then I'll try and address those in the next episode. Um, I want to try and keep this down to three episodes because obviously it's going to be a bit uh, more information than you need. Um, this one, the next one we're actually poor, and then the third one where we demold and then clean up the blanks and then you can see what they look like at the end. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much and I shall see you next time. Take care.